And I've had disparaging comments about my own voice in the past. I mean, I remember when I first started broadcasting in television, the uh, the Glasgow Evening News <clears throat> describing a program that I did in the temperance movement said, Billy K. mouths gutturals about the temperance movement. I mean, in a way, that's how... F and when I was speaking on that program, the temperance movement, I was using the language I'm using just now, which is... You know, Scottish standard English with a strong Scottish accent, but I'm not speaking Scots, which I can. But even then, 30 years ago in the 1980s, it was regarded as something to be noticed that somebody was speaking in a broad Scottish accent. And that's changed dramatically. That is now normalised, the Scottish voice on radio and television. But a few pioneers had to break barriers for that to be normalised. Just to change subject a little bit, you've talked about the sort of culture element and things you noticed through your education, but um, was it was that part of it, or were there other things that led to your decision to support Scottish independence? It's just I heard the the podcast with uh, that you did with Derek Bateman, and there were some echoes there in my own life. I've just always felt a strong identity with Scotland and with Scottish culture and with, with everything Scottish. So I'm a heart before my head nationalist, if you like. But everything that I've studied through my university and then being able to do all these programmes in Scottish history and culture for the BBC, everything that I've done over the years has strengthened that conviction that I have that Scottish culture and Scottish identity is something extremely positive with its egalitarian tradition, with its tradition of educating people, with its poetic tradition, its great tradition of writing brilliant novels through to the present day. We're living in a golden age of Scottish literature. Everything that I've experienced working in the field of Scottish culture has strengthened my resolve and my desire to see the natural progress of that towards the restoration of Scottish independence. To me, it's the most natural thing in the world for Scots to rule themselves and not rely on posh boys from Eton eh, to, to rule over us. And having said that, having two gorgeous daughters who went to Edinburgh University and a son who went to Edinburgh University, like me, my house has been visited over the years by numerous good-looking young men who've gone to Eton who are chasing my daughters and lovelier, better-mannered people you could not meet. But they knew nothing about Scotland and cared even less about Scotland. And these are the kind of people who dominated Scottish politics every other decade for the past hundred years. And it's just, it's time the cleath was out of that para. We've lived too long in this condition. It's time to take responsibility for ourselves and our culture and our nation. So you're not the natural target for David Cameron when he sends up George Osborne and William Hague to convince us not to vote for independence then? No, I would just take them, take them aside, set them down and tell them where they've gone totally wrong. Someone needs to do it. So, um, so <laughs> how do you feel the campaign's going so far? It lacks a bit of passion, but I think that'll come. I mean, I, I presume it's a strategy of going for the head, the head, the head, rather than the heart, the heart, the heart. Because maybe if you build up the heart and pluck the heartstrings too early, it could become wearing. But I think closer to the vote, then I think that has to come more to the fore. Because ultimately, ultimately these things are a leap of faith. We don't know what will happen in, in 10 or 20 years. And the No campaign has the advantage of, they know roughly the way Britain has been in the past 100 years and roughly the way it will be in the next few decades. Scotland will be something different. I think something more vibrant and exciting. The building of a new nation, but the, the Yes campaign doesn't have that certainty to go on. What I think will happen is that when we do get the Yes vote, and I hope very much, and I believe it will happen next year, but if it doesn't happen next year, it'll happen in 10 or 20 years. I might not be around to see it, but it will happen. And within five years or ten years of it happening, it'll be become 
the most normal thing in the world. And people will think, what was all that about? What were all the scare tactics about? Because every country that's become independent in the past hundred years, and there are quite a few of them, within a decade or so, has become normalised. And they've realised the benefits of being independent, and they've never looked back. I remember a, an interview a couple of years ago when Iceland had economic problems. It was Leslie Ridder who did the interview, and she interviewed some Icelandic uh, ladies, and she interviewed some Icelandic women about the crisis. And Leslie posed the question, did you ever think it would be good to go back to being a, a colony and part of Denmark? And they just burst out laughing because it was the most ridiculous thing to even contemplate. So for them in Iceland, and it's the same with the Norwegians after they gain their independence, as soon as Scotland becomes independent, it will become a normal country. And a lot of the bizarre anomalies that exist in Scotland will become things of the past and will be regarded as bizarre things of the past. They should have been corrected much, much earlier in our history. Mm, I can I can only agree and hope I I hope it turns out to be that way. So, are you involved uh, in any of the campaigns? Are you in any campaign groups? Are you doing any speaking? Or well, I'm a, I've got an invitation to speak for the Yes campaign in East Lothian. The date hasn't been fixed, but uh, I'm going to do something for them. I'm involved with another interesting one, another interesting group which is culturally oriented, which is not part of the of the official Yes campaign. I would like to do more for the Yes campaign, and anything I can do, uh, I will do if, if, if asked. But for the last referendum, which you'll be too young to uh, remember... So but, you mean 79 yeah. or 97? 97. 97. I'm not too yeah. young. I voted in that. Oh, did you? Good. All right. Yeah. You look young. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was involved in a thing called the Bus Party, I had been a trustee of Common Cause, one of the pro-Parliament groups, and I helped organise with people like Neil Asherson and Will Storer the bus party in which Willie McIlvany was the lead artist, and he led a group of artists on a bus round Scotland promoting the Yes Yes vote. And we did gigs, I organised gigs in Dundee and Aberdeen, and we performed and then we discussed and we we hoped would people would be convinced to vote yes. And, you know, that happened. So we're doing the same again in May and in September of this year. And uh, we haven't finalised it yet, but we're going round Scotland, two different trips. And one or two well-known writers like James Robertson and musicians like Karim Polwart will be taking part in it. Others will join at different points, and I'll not give any other names just now, but there'll be a fame, uh, quite a number of famous writers and artists will join the bus party at various points on the route. And we're deliberately avoiding the big cities. We're going to the back country and talking to people there, going to <clears throat> take the message to places that sometimes don't get visits by a uh, famous writers, for example. So we're very much looking forward to that, and I'm, in, I'm involved in the plans for that. Great. And uh, just to tie the things together that we've been talking about a bit, you said that you think even if we don't win this time, independence will come in the next referendum. Do you think that one of the important factors in bringing this about has been and will be the re-establishment of Scottish culture and identity as a positive thing instead of something to be denigrated and downplayed? Absolutely. The writers and the artists have been at the forefront of the cause of the movement for first a Scottish Parliament and now Scottish independence. So they've always been ahead of the politicians. The politicians eventually caught up and huge numbers of the society eventually caught up and eventually everyone will eventually catch up and realise how normal it is for Scotland to be an independent, proud and independent nation. Okay, and uh, the final, final thing is that normally uh, the guest chooses the tune, but I normally stick on a, a little outro at the end and do it that way. But we're going to do something a little bit different today. So would you like to explain to us about the song you want to play? Yes, uh, <clears throat> this is uh, a piece of music by a young composer and harp player, classic player called Sarah McNeil. 
when I was making my series on Scottish nationalism, a guy came up to me at the commemoration of the 1820 Rising at Bonnie Muir and told me that his daughter had written a piece of music about 1820, celebrating the lives of three of the men who were killed, who were martyred, Beard, Harvey and Wilson, in that struggle in 1820. And I was a bit sceptical, but I said, yeah, please send me the music. But when I heard the music, I found it extremely moving. I found it a wonderful piece of emotive music. And she uses the voice. She uses the voices of the, the men who are about to die in the cause of democracy in Scotland. And she uses the voices of Lord Byron and other people as voiceovers. And this sad piece of music, which laments the men who died at the 1820 Rising, but celebrates their lives and their great contribution to the cause that uh, is part of us all. So eventually, Sarah recorded this piece of music as part of, I think it was part of our final project in her last year at the Royal Conservatoire in Glasgow. She's a, she belongs to a band called Cherry Grove, and she plays with other people as a class act duo, and she's got her own CDs out and things like that. And she recorded this piece of music, and because of my love of the, the music and my interest in it, she asked if I would record the voiceovers of Beard Harvey and Wilson, and there's a wee bit of Lord Byron there as well. So I'm going to send you this piece of music, and I hope you find it as emotive and uplifting and wonderfully Scottish as I do. Okay, Billy, thanks very much. That's been great. You're very welcome. Spirit 